Hello and welcome back to Planet Sail and on course our regular look at the sailing world. Well yes, here in the UK we're still in lockdown, I'm still in tinker mode. But there's also been a lot of very interesting stories around the world. In fact one that was quite close to home, up in Ipswich, when I went and visited a fascinating yard. More on that later. So, in this episode... As the arms race continues in the cup, we take a look at what teams have been up to and how they've got back on the water. Beauty and bold talk in Ipswich. I can certainly foresee a situation within five years when we never fit another diesel engine to a sailing boat. I get all misty-eyed over a class, get bored sailing and end up playing with hairdryers. But first, I make no excuse for kicking off once again with the America's Cup. Because while so many events have been cancelled or postponed around the world, this one is still very much on. The America's Cup has never been fair. At least that's the commonly held view over the last 169 years. Be it the cost, the local conditions or the rules, there's always something that skews the pitch. But this time around, current world events look like they could skew the pitch even further. But before we get into that, what you might not have known about this America's Cup cycle is that wind tunnels and towing tanks aren't allowed. So in this episode, we join INEOS Team UK to discover some of the techniques they use to design these extraordinary boats. My role here is to analyse the hydrodynamic and aerodynamic performance of the boat and in order to do that we put it into a virtual wind tunnel or towing tank and we use the Siemens SimCenter Star CCM Plus software which is essentially our virtual wind tunnel process. So we have simulation at multiple levels, we have uh, sort of steady state straight line optimization of the yacht, we have uh, optimizations of the yacht through manoeuvres etc. But one of the very key things we do here is the human in the loop simulator. So we put our sailing team on a motion platform driven by the physics of the yacht. They are handling the steering wheels and the, the infrastructure they have on board the boat. And the sailors will go and sail digital twins of the boats inside the simulator. And they will be able to run the boat in a dynamic form and come back to us and tell us how the boat performed. The America's Cup is all about design and technology. So for us to be partnered with Siemens and to be able to access tools like Siemens NX makes a huge difference for our designers and engineers. And for us as sailors, to be able to understand the design of the boat that much better and make those key developments. This time around, we have to use a single configuration across the entire race. We declare that configuration prior to racing and we have to optimise across a very broad range of conditions. At the simplest level, a yacht is an interface vehicle. So it operates in two fluids, so the sea and the, the air. And there's a velocity difference between those two fluids and we generate all the forces on the yachts by harvesting that energy difference between the two. In order to make the boat fast, we need to do that harvesting as efficiently as we possibly can. Our competitiveness comes down to the accuracy with which we model, the design ideas we can push into that, and the speed with which we can test and iterate on those design ideas. And all of that is driven by the simulation process that's underpinned by the data that we generate using Siemens Solutions products. The date of the America's Cup is not going to change. We know exactly when that's going to be, so we have a finite amount of time to design that boat. The Siemens suite of software helps us through the whole process. We can all be in the same model collaboratively at the same time. All of our release process is taken care of and we can make changes very quickly when we need to. We are working in the digital world and that makes our lives quicker, more productive. What they're less keen to talk about is the new look to the first of their AC-75s. When it went to Sardinia at the end of last year, it looked like this and came back looking like this, with a new addition to the bottom of the hull. Which was interesting because the local team Luna Rosso Prada Pirelli always looked like this. So why? Well, we think it's an end plate effect to help with that critical transition phase from displacement sailing to foiling. Like just about everyone else in the world, lockdown forced all four of the cup teams to stay ashore and at home. But recently, two cup teams have been getting back out on the water. Luna Rossa was the first when they took their boat onto the water in late April. 
According to their skipper and CEO, Max Serena, they've been given permission for 10 days of testing at their base in Sardinia. In an interview with Italian sailing magazine Farivela, he explained that their answer to social distancing while sailing was to replace some of the grinders with electric motors to reduce the crew from 11 to 5. Meanwhile, the innovative Kiwis came up with a different solution to deal with the problem of social distancing. A solution that not only got their shore teams back together, but got them back on the water too. Well, we knew there was going to be challenges with level three, and one of those is um, social distancing and working out the distance. And really, you don't want to be, when you're trying to work and we've got a lot of catching up to do, and you don't want to be having to think about that the whole time. It wouldn't it be great if it was something that can tell you. So as a technology company, we work with technology companies, and I go Brent to Ring and Dave, and they have cracked it. The tags that the people are wearing in the room uses a system called ultra wideband, which communicates with the anchors, the, the red triangles in the room, and, and it uses a system called two-way radio ranging to measure the distance to each anchor and then triangulates its position in the room and then transmits that information back to a gateway. So it's a little bit like indoor GPS, where GPS can't work through inside buildings, the system will measure the accuracy of people down to about 10 centimetres. And this enables two outcomes. The first is that it reminds the wearer of their personal space if someone gets too close. And the second is about contact tracing, which it achieves by logging that data. And so in this case, we simply did the best that we can with the resources that we had available to us. And, um, and we just worked as a remote team to make it happen. So when we start back at work, we'll have these devices which will make it easy for the guys to work out whether they're inside the circle, be it one metre or two metres, depending on whether they're inside or outside. It's really important for us to get back out in the water today and continue the testing programme uh, to develop and try and get the boat faster as we uh, head to next year. Obviously, like so many businesses, it's been um, tough for us to stop for, for five weeks, um, but, you know, we're, we've got back into it now in level three, the management of the team and it's worked really hard to ensure we can get back into it and, and operate in a safe environment and you know, everyone here is taking it very seriously but uh, you know, it's also at the same time important for us to get back on the water and continue developing. So. It's been a long time ashore the last six weeks. We've engaged with the government, the Coast Guard, the Harbour Master and we've been uh, very careful to take all the level three precautions possible to make sure that we uh, are keeping our distance from each other. We're all wearing personal separation devices which have a little alarm system on to, to make sure we're keeping that distance. We are uh, reducing the number of support people on the water and spreading it out over four support craft. Looking forward to and grateful that we can get back out there today and, uh, and continue developing so it's, a, yeah, it's an important day. Yeah, it was great to get back out on the water today. Um, you know, it's been a, a little while with us having you know, some pretty critical things to, to test for our race program. So you know, we took the opportunity today to take a bit of a skeleton crew out and you know, try and tick off a couple of things and you know, have a really efficient day. You know, definitely been great to get back out there. Um, you know, I think a, a lot of us see the America's Cup possibly as a bit of light at the end of the tunnel uh, you know, next summer. So you know, we're really you know, trying to do everything we can to, to keep it here for another, another cycle. On the other side of the world, American Magic has been ashore because of COVID-19 and on standby to ship the first of their two AC-75s after they aborted the shipment to Sardinia. Now we hear that Defiant is on a ship and going to New Zealand and will probably arrive before the Kiwis get theirs back from their aborted tour to Europe. Conveniently, American Magic have been releasing this footage of their training just to keep us all interested in the meantime. So that just leaves the Brits, INEOS Team UK. Their boat, Britannia, has only just arrived back and the team, like the rest of the country, is waiting to find out when it can get back afloat. Time on the water is always a big deal in any America's Cup cycle. Historically, the America's Cup has always been considered to be biased in favour of the defenders. But this global crisis appears to be putting an even bigger tilt on the pitch. 
Every time a 505 sails past, my long-suffering crew in our RS400 has to listen to me bleat on about how much I love the 505. So when this footage came floating into Planet Sail's inbox, I just couldn't help myself. The 505 sailed in 17 different countries around the world. Incredibly successful class. Has something for all the different types of sailors. We have professional sailors here that are on the America's Cup program and sailing foiling cats and still come and race 505s. And then we've got the weekend sailors who really enjoy it just as much. The common thing about it all, it doesn't matter where you are, where you finish, everybody comes ashore with a smile. Beautiful and timeless, I'd say. But as anyone who's seen a modern one will know, they're a complete string fest in the cockpit. But apparently, that's no problem, so long as you're not colour blind. As we all know, uh, as the wind strength goes up and we have to depower our boats, we put in rake. We probably also know that as we rake, we need to compensate with the mast ram and the jibs go outboard and the side stay tension changes and in some cases we have mast uh, uh, side stay tracks that we have to adjust as well. Now I'm here with Robin Jewson in his boat and I'm going to get him to show you a really simple calibration system um, so that he knows that what he can set the boat up really quickly as the conditions change. So first of all I'll show you my rake which is down there with all the different colours which is red through to orange which is our uh, furthest aft rake then it'll be my ram which will be down here and then my jib sheets which are along here 12 to uh, 15 knot wind range so let me understand when you uh, put the rake in you just pick the color and then set your ram and your side stays in your gym all to the same color all exactly the same. so if you keep all of these all the red when you do when you're on red you put everything on red when you're on green you put everything on green you're keeping the mast configuration the same all the way back that's the theory, That's exactly yeah? What the, the luff round you want to keep is, is close each time, uh, otherwise it doesn't suit the luff round. So you're trying to make it all exactly the same. Hmm. I'm all right with the colours. It's just everything else. Earlier this year, I went up to Ipswich to go and take a look at Spirit Yachts, a company that's become famous for building some of the prettiest boats in the world. But when I got there, I found there was a much bigger story. Spirit yachts up here in Ipswich on the east coast of the UK have been building beautiful boats for 27 years. They've built 74 boats over an enormous range. Their first boat was a 37 footer and they're just about to commission a 111 absolute gorgeous super yacht. And I ask them how many boats they build and they tell you about 250 foot a year, which pretty much sums up how diverse they are. But their story goes quite a lot deeper than that. So I came up here to come and have a look. This is a company that is as much about style as it is about boat building. Sean McMillan is the founder and CEO of Spirit Yachts and the brains behind the now famous name. I've never set out to design or build a pastiche, replica, repro. It doesn't interest me. What I am interested in is designing and building very efficient, contemporary, thoroughly contemporary yachts that sail beautifully, but I don't see why that means they can't look beautiful as well. I love the aesthetics of not only yachts, but all sorts of things, whether it's cars or houses or jewelry, or it doesn't matter. Um, there, is a, there is a 
classic design ethos that runs through almost anything you care to name, which, if you get it right, is so inspiring and it's such a, it just touches something in people's souls that they can relate to. Aside from building some of the prettiest boats in the world, he also makes a strong case for building in timber. But his argument is not necessarily what you'd expect. If you've had experience of old wooden boats, they rightly have a pretty dubious reputation because they are they're old and they leak and they they usually smell and, and I mean they were pretty ghastly things. Um, that being said, there are some exquisitely beautiful vintage wooden boats around which are now uh, beautifully looked after. But as a general rule, if you can try and think of our boats as being actually not that dissimilar to glass fibre. The difference is that instead of using glass fibres, we're using wood fibres, and instead of bonding the glass fibres together with polyester resin, our wood fibres are already bonded together by nature, and they're cross-linked with an incredibly complex cellular structure linking them all together. If you look at them as a pure engineering material, they're just better than anything else by a long way. Um, even carbon fibre doesn't, doesn't come anywhere near it in terms of strength. Um, and unlike any other material, wood has a memory. And if you bend a piece of wood, it'll go back to where it was. It will constantly take the shock loads that any boat's subjected to at sea, and it'll always go back to where it was. It'll take an infinite amount of punishment. Whereas carbon will take a certain amount, but it doesn't like it and it will eventually start to delaminate. Steel, very, very strong. If you look at old steel boats, you can see between the bulkheads where they've, where they've rippled. And, um, so wood is pretty much unique in that sense. Sustainability is a big deal for Spirit Yachts. And again, Sean has some strong views. You cannot be involved building wooden boats and not be acutely aware of timber supplies, and your environmental responsibilities about them. And we are meticulous now in only using timbers from um, managed forests or managed resources. Teak is a really good case in point. Um, pretty much all the teak now available on the yacht market is coming from Burma. And we just came to the conclusion we're not going to do that anymore. Um, and we uh, then discovered using lignia, it's a thoroughly sustainable timber, it looks exactly like teak, it weathers like teak, it's uh, a bit denser so it's more long lasting. We were so impressed with it and so pleased with the result that we just have decided that is our standard finish. Um, and I hope that we never have to use teak again on a boat. Um, we stopped using Brazilian mahogany about uh, 10 years ago, probably, for a very similar reason, that uh, that was all coming out of South America and you couldn't guarantee where it was coming from. Well, as soon as they won't guarantee where it's coming from, you know damn well where it's coming from. And so that was the end of that. So, yeah, we try and be very, very careful. Um, almost all of our timber is plantation grown. Um, the little small amounts that aren't plantation grown are from very carefully managed forests where they're just taking a particular tree, say one an acre or something like that. So it's a, yeah, it's really important to us. Um, there are all sorts of other considerations. Uh, it's only a, going to be a very short time before we have to uh, deal with the concept of end of life legislation and we can all see that coming down the track and I think most of our industry has buried its head in the sand about it. Well, I don't have any qualms about end of life. Firstly, the life on these is going to be way more than 100 years, so, which means I probably won't have to worry about it anyway. <laughs> but even when you do, even if you actually had to dispose of one of these, it's a pretty easy thing to do. But how are the manufacturers going to dispose of the hundreds of thousands of fiberglass boats in the world? which at the moment can't be recycled. This is, a, this is a technology whose time came about 4,000 years ago, and amazingly, it's coming back again. <laughs> but actually, you're going a lot further, aren't you? Because now, you're, some of your more modern boats, in fact, this one, 
has actually got some, it's got electric motors, for example, yeah. hasn't it? Tell yeah. us a bit about that. And... Um, I mean, if you take the sort of five significant boats we've got in build at the moment, three of them are electric drive. And I can certainly foresee a situation within five years when we never fit another diesel engine to a sailing boat. But with a sailing boat, it's now totally viable to have a fully electric drive. Um, we've got one boat in build here that has no hydrocarbons on board at all. No petrol, no diesel, no gas. Um, it's all electric and it's a long distance cruising boat. And that's just the start, as Managing Director Nigel Stewart explains. If someone says to me, I want an environmentally friendly yacht, um, there are different categories of this. Um, and there's the extreme environmental boat where it doesn't burn any hydrocarbons on board. And then there's the, the other end of it where it's the most efficient. So in a way, the extreme one will be um, something like a Tesla, going to that element of it, it's all electric and, and it doesn't require anything else. Um, and the sort of compromise would be a hybrid, it would be your Toyota Prius design of uh, structure of the engine, engineering on the, on the boat. So we sit down with the customer and look at where they, where they want to be. Um, and the joy on a yacht that you don't have on the road is while sailing, we have the opportunity of spilling a propeller and generating energy. Um, and we also have the option of solar and wind generation, which also should be considered. But it does mean a complete rethink about how the whole yacht works, because in a traditional boat where you've got a large diesel generator chugging along at 1500 RPM, it's just burning fuel, and then you've got the propulsion system again, never working at its most efficient level, you have to rethink everything because suddenly you haven't got that power there. So it just, you have to look at the heating, hot water, the pumping, the, the, the refrigeration, the freezer, all that stuff. You have to reconsider the whole thing. You can't just go, we've always fitted this, let's just use that. You have to start right from the beginning. The most extreme boat that you've got, the one that you mentioned, think about no hydrocarbons. Tell us a bit about We've got that. a 44 uh, sailing boat, which um, no hydrocarbons, there's no generator, there's no diesel heater, there's no um, diesel hot water. It's all done off electricity. So he will leave the dock with full batteries and set sail with one electric winch. So there is a compromise. You, know, you have to keep your power consumption down. Um, set sail and go sailing. And while sailing, he will have solar sails. So his mainsail will have solar cloth on it. Well, he'll generate about two kilowatts maximum. But I'd work on, really, it's going to be between half a kilowatt and a kilowatt on average for eight hours of the day and then he, he can use that energy to propel the boat or regenerate whilst he's sailing because he's got a variable pitch propeller system on it where it can turn and then generate up to a kilowatt and a half of power and that's really useful power because that's constant. It's not like the sun if it's got shade or not. Whilst you're sailing at so six knots, he'll be generating a kilowatt and a half. So his range on his batteries, so with full set of batteries leaving the marina, he'll be able to do between 30 and 40 nautical miles at I think it's six and a half, seven knots, so a reasonable speed on the, on, on the hull. Um, and you know, he won't be panicking at the end of it. He'll have enough power to moor out with enough stopping power, if that makes sense. It doesn't just die off on you. It gives you sensible readouts as you get to the end of your battery life. Now, you mentioned that 111 that's behind you. I mean, that's really a big boat to put electric motors on. It's it just, is. It's, um, is it total electric power on there? It's a complete electric power. So it's got a 100 kilowatt uh, drive motor on it. It's also got a 50 kilowatt uh, hydraulic drive motor, all running off high voltage DC. So that's 380 volts. It's the same as electric cars have. Um, and it's got a 20, uh, 40, 24 volt bank as well, um, and 12 volt bank of batteries. So each thing does a different thing on the boat to be the most efficient. And we're trying to not change power from the high voltage to the low voltage too often. So it's a bit of a clever management on that. But it, it has taken a restructure of the whole yacht and how it all works. When you start talking about the other systems which we've touched on, things like your heating, your hot water, all of them have a benefit if we were to use them on a normal yacht. You would use less diesel. So although they're running a risk potentially that they're having electric drive on their yacht, we could retrofit a standard engine back into them. But also we're future proofing it because we all know fuel's going to get more expensive. So what fuel they do run from their generator or a backup heating system they're using less of it than they would have on a traditional way. So mm. we are trying to be very safe for them and not take any risk where we think this is so risky that they could end up with a, a, a yacht they could never sell. Nigel has been driving the charge in many other areas of the company's business as well, not least how their factory operates. So here we are in one of our buildings where we've taken an approach to really reduce everything we do. So first of all, the lighting. We've got LED lights. 
Now, all the lighting in here is using slightly less power than one of the original lights, and it's also brighter and easier to look at. We have to keep this space humidity controlled and temperature controlled, so we use heaters to do that. We're using, we changed our heating and how it works. First of all, we did some insulation in the building, so it's better insulated, but we are now using 50% less heat energy than we used in the past. Um, we've got carbon recycling everywhere, We've got plastic recycling. We now monitor our bins to make sure that all our bins uh, are examined to what we are actually throwing away. So we can push the, what we're throwing away further upstream so the joiners can be told, or the electricians, look, you've got the following mess coming in. Why are we now throwing this stuff away? And we can review it. And our waste, we used to have a skip emptied every week. We're now down to every two weeks. So there's a massive change in the waste going out the building. It is an extraordinary company and a yard that takes you into another world the minute you walk through the door. But just before we leave this story, I have to show you a few pictures of the interior of the Spirit 111. Designed by Rhodes Young and where there isn't a straight line in the boat, it's the most remarkable and striking interior I think I've ever seen. As soon as we can get back on the road, we'll be covering this boat in more detail, so keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, also watch out for the full interviews with Sean and Nigel, which will be going on to the sustainability section. Make sure you check that out. So what have you been up to during lockdown to keep yourself busy? Have you played any games? Perhaps some e-sailing games? It wouldn't surprise me. It's all the rage at the moment after all. But it got me thinking about board games. So I went rummaging around in the loft and I found these. Salute to a great sailor, it says. Well, he certainly was. My father bought me this game as a kid and I absolutely loved it. The darker blue for the stronger winds, you got an extra square. And the arrows signified the current. And it was made all the more special, I guess, a lot later on when I was an adult because I got to sail Gypsy Moth 4 shortly after her restoration, which is a fantastic moment, having grown up with the board game and the book and, of course, all the stories of the legend Sir Francis Chichester. But this was the game that got me through my rebellious teens. I bought it for 50p. I'm so pleased I found it in the loft. I thought it had been thrown out. This, I think, is one of the best games that was ever made, a board game for sailing. It was really, really clever. It was a tactical game. And you had a couple of dice, and basically you threw these dice, but it didn't tell you how far you went on the board. These dice basically dictated whether the wind backed or veered and how the wind strength changed. And depending on how the wind strength changed, depended on how many spaces you got to move. So we made the rules a lot more complicated. You could hoist kites, and if you did, you had to throw that one, and then you had to throw this one to see if you broached or not, and then I don't know what that one was for at all, but it was all written down here in our notes. And then I had a flashback. I went online and found this. So what sailing games did you have? We'd love to know. Send us a note, send us a video if you can. Do it landscape, send it through. The contact details are at the end. We'd love to hear more.
once again and as always thanks so much for watching please do remember to subscribe it makes a big difference to what we can do with the show thank you also for all the fantastic comments that you've sent through please do keep them coming we love reading them in the meantime stay safe keep well and we'll see you next time Thank you.